Good evening. Welcome to the uh, lecture series again. Uh, tonight our guest is Sanford Quinter, who comes to us these days from Chicago, where he is a distinguished visiting professor uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, otherwise known as Tigerman Tech. But his real home is, of course, in New York, where all such theoretician roost. And from there, he has, over the last decade or so, uh, proceeded to inject into the realm of architecture a series of positions, strategies, and debates that have, one might say, radically altered uh, one's perception of the relationship between the practice of building, the construction of the city, and the way in which we represent the urban environment to ourselves. And he has done this uh, through a series of writings and editing efforts that started with the production of Zone Magazine back in 1983. And uh, Zone Magazine begat Zone Books, and now Zone Books, Sanford informs me, has just uh, begat something called Swerve Editions, whose first product, War in the Age of Intelligent Machines, uh, is hot off the press and will soon be in the bookstores. And Swerve Editions, Sanford promises, will bring us not solely French authors. Sanford. Uh, gets to be a distinguished professor, not only because he writes like a dream and jets around like a bird, but also because he has a PhD in comparative, li comparative literature from Columbia University, where he studied with uh, Edward Said, uh, which he received after doing work in, uh, at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, he hails originally from Toronto, and having now regressed him almost back to the grave, I will give you Sanford Quinter, who will speak to us tonight about soft systems. Thank you. I'm wondering how long it'll take to get this into a comfortable position, just to Is this working properly? Can, is it? Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Have we got a sign? I just want to make sure the slides are set up and ready. They are? Great. Um, I'm just waiting for my eyes to accustom themselves again. I know that I was invited to speak in this lecture series on the metropolis because the book I edited six years ago on the contemporary city and the essay I contributed to that book on the modernist origins of contemporary space somehow still associate me, me with that subject. Yet I must confess that though I have not lost any interest in the subject of the city in, in principle, I have found little of real theoretical interest these last years, either in my own mind or in the work of others to sustain the type of furious, yet often flaky, speculation upon which we all embarked in the 80s, factoring electronic data technologies and mass image distribution networks into the lineage of urban transformations effected in earlier decades by the advent of electricity, telephones, automobiles, and TVs. <clears throat> Among the most powerful tendencies emerging today, it seems to me, for renegotiating and reconceiving the problem of inhabitation and intervention or design in the urban realm are what I will call inflection or perturbation theories, that is, design strategies that resemble their not always so noble economic models of trickle-down and laissez-faire economics and single control theory, such as the Fed's perpetual tweaking of interest rate dials, followed by that most hip and up-to-date posture of tactical wait and see, then tweak again, etc. Now, I keep hearing these incredibly thunderous bangs coming. Is that some speech problem that I have, or is there something? 
Is there something I can do about that? Or is it just me who's being frightened by them? All right. Is it my knees rattling? Is that? <laughs> now, these emerging techniques, one could say, reflect a fundamental shift in interest away from the simple, readily apparent contents. This is not indigestion, you know, I haven't eaten in hours. Um, now, somebody who's experienced with this microphone, I'm sure, can tell me what to do about this. Farther away? Tell you what, I'll talk louder and I'll shout at the mic. Um, now, where were we? We were talking about a fundamental shift in interest away from the simple, readily apparent contents and configurations of urban systems to their more constitutive but generally invisible dynamics. And it's dynamics that I want to talk about today. Um, so in a sense, what we have is this, this movement away from image and essence and toward relations. What I'm calling inflection or perturbation strategies are those that use the autonomous, little understood, but newly intuitable, that's to say intuitable only uh, in the last few years, newly intuitable self-structuring or self-designing processes that are manifested by indeed built right into many complex systems. By complex, I mean those systems in which a multitude of interconnected processes and pressures integrate spontaneously and naturally into a continuous series of evolving effects. This particular tendency in urban practice and theory is reflected today as much in situationist and neo-situationist ideologies as in the recent town plan schemes of Rem Kolhas and the commercial appearance of cheap, interactive, software-driven, urban model engines such as the SimCity program for desktop computers. Six years ago, in my article on Antonio Santalia, the reason I bring it up is because I kept asking, why are you asking me to this lecture series on the metropolis? And apparently it was uh, for that reason. Uh, not that I deserve it, but I really wanted to come here. Um, in any case, on that article on Santalia's futurist urban theory, I argued that a deep transformation in the theory of time, in the theory of time, which is also something that I want to let remain a kind of leitmotif through the rest of the, uh, the comments that I will make, the theory of time had already begun to manifest itself in the urban literature of the late 19th century. Massive and especially intensely accelerated industrial, economic, and technological innovations had begun to transform our collective experience of the material and historical world. The once imperceptibly slow and stable rhythms of history that earlier furnished a kind of immobile ground for our more volatile and fluid human figure began to oscillate in patterns of shorter and shorter duration effecting, one might say, a crucial phase shift of the social world in historical experience from the solid to the liquid state. At any rate, what emerged within a decade or two, I argued, was the first concrete schema worked out in refined and systematic detail, one that manifested, and I will quote one sentence from that original analysis, one that manifested the novel spatial properties of a pressurized field, the preeminence of linear vectorial units, the atomization of molar forms, the themes of sliding, frictionless impacts, and wave phenomena like interference and flow, so that it soon became clear that one was dealing with a space characterized more by hydrodynamics and laminar flows than by statics, metrics, or the physics of solids. That's the end of the quote. And I apologize for quoting myself, but um, uh, I was rather amazed myself to find that themes that I've been working on eight or nine years ago were so close to the ones I'm interested in now. My arguments tonight will present the case that these developments, which appeared in the architectural realm as mere intimations and speculations 80 years ago, are presently emerging around us with a force perhaps as sudden and definitive as it is inexorable, and that our relationship to the material and social world may currently be undergoing a transformation 
fully as epical as, those, as the developments that first ushered in the modern era over five centuries ago. The subject of my talk is what I have called, or what I will call here, soft systems. The notion of soft systems actually, uh, actually describes but a single aspect of a more general and what I claim to be a new type of space that I have elsewhere referred to as biological space. Soft systems refers to a recently emerged, or more accurately, a presently emerging constellation of system qualities, material properties, and intellectual concepts that together, together as an almost as a single organismal entity, are reshaping the world around us. Now before beginning to explain and map out these soft systems, I would like to put forward three assertions, and I mean these as nothing more at this point than assertions, uh, which belong to the larger argument, but which, um, which I'm, I'm unable uh, explicitly to support here. They will remain then as assertions, and I will pick them up as I go through. Um, but they're important because they do belong, in a way, to the larger program. The first, that our culture is moving decisively away from classical mechanism and reductionism. Indeed, and this is really the crux, that the physics model as a system and method of explanation is giving way to a biological model and that this constitutes one of the most dramatic shifts in thought since the Renaissance. Two, that it is an essential property of living systems. Now we're moving away to a relatively ahistorical uh, problem here. It is an essential property of living systems, that's to say all living systems all throughout time, that a dynamics of information, a dynamics of information has somewhere gained control over the dynamics of energy. The dynamics of energy being that which in classical terms is generally understood to drive non-living systems. And that this transition from a simple dynamics of energy to a complex dynamics of information has not only become thinkable, that's to say only thinkable for the first time in general and abstract terms, but actually describes a crucial phase transition that we and our material world are undergoing. Now our capacity, our collective cultural epistemological, scientific, technological capacity to describe this state of affairs far exceeds our capacity to explain it, making our particular historical moment one of great potential creativity, precisely because description rather than analytical uh, explanation is what, is what really is driving the scientific dynamo at this point. But this moment is also treacherous and volatile in the extreme. Now the third, um, the third assertion, and then I'll get on, is, uh, and which in some ways follows from the, from the previous two, is that we are actually passing now from an age, let's say, of mimetic representation to one of modeling. Now, well, to soft systems. The concept of soft systems has a difficult, complex, and sporadic pedigree within Western philosophical and scientific tradition, though it did emerge gloriously in full force across a wide variety of domains during the 1960s, weaving a vast but fragile tissue of speculation at that time, only to settle back exhausted and deprived of clear direction or practical application for well over a decade that is, until the hard sciences and their panoply of technological hardware were able to catch up. And by technological hardware, I don't mean anything big and fancy like, uh, like cyclotrons, but rather some simple things like uh, desktop calculators and, um, in the late 70s and, and, uh, and, of course, PCs. The work of Bateson, Kessler, Chomsky, if anybody still remembers those people, and their followers, as well as the many proponents of cybernetics theory, information theory, general systems theory, holistic science, etc., all belonged to this general 60s paradigm. But perhaps no single system of thought encapsulated these developments quite as acutely or movingly 
as did the collective experience of two fundamental, let's call them Copernican, for qualitative reasons rather than quantitative reasons, two fundamental Copernican events. Could I have the first slide, please? First, the hypothesis of continental drift, accepted and popularized for the first time by way of the newly assembled theory of plate tectonics. And the second, the eerily disturbing but awesomely beautiful images of this type, transmitted by the Apollo astronauts during their successive expeditions to the moon. These two events were able to organize for the popular imagination, that is, through an at once sensual and existential image, a profound shifting of the relations in which human being was classically and implicitly seen to unfold. What emerged for us was a new, even terrifying concept of energy. Plate tectonics depicted the Earth's surface in the throes of a slow but ceaseless ballet of semi-rigid tiles percolating in wild trajectories across its crustal face, abrading and careening into one another while held ever aloft and in motion by the raging fires that drive the system from below. The Apollo photographs from outer space, however, were more subtle and troubling still. The Earth, seen now in weird perspective, rising before one as an exterior orbiting planet, was simply astonishing. More than simply an, an inert yet hospitable system of thermal and energy flows, the Earth appeared in its distance both strange and exuberant, like a slowly stirring animal artfully forging and cultivating its lair. The shimmering complexity of movement and color was at once awesome and disturbing. As a system or spectacle, it appeared strangely moist, layered and kinetic, saturated with pattern and nuance, at once fragile in its kaleidoscope of shifting hues and textures, yet visibly robust against the crystalline void of deep space. A Soviet astronaut, witnessing firsthand the same view, commented that it is only through a terrible misconception that we have come to call our planet Earth, for it is plain for anyone to see that it is in fact really water. This massive liquid object, rising in the sky before us, came to us too as a terrible surprise. It seemed so elegantly and uncannily poised between stability and instability, or rather instability, like a small child on a large bicycle, happy, stable, and safe, so long as the system is moving, yet sure to break down if any part is brought to a halt. In other words, the stability of the system is rooted in its dynamics, in its capacity to handle and process movement, change, difference, in a word, information, transforming all irregular ripples and disturbances in the universe into engines of creation by absorbing these into its own already existing and deeply intertwined internal movements. Now this spectacular integrating engine was driven by something one knew, but what? Between the fires raging at its core and the infernal sun that bakes the planet mercilessly from without, a thin, indeed incredibly thin layer, or membrane, inserts itself, one that seethes with structure, events, life, and serves to bob the entire planet up, cool, wet, and sassy, like a desert bloom in the desiccated equilibrium of space. The system, one might say, is driven by its softness, its capacity to move, and in moving to differentiate internally, from which follow the capacities to absorb, transform, and exchange information with its surroundings, to develop complex interdependent subsystems, and of course also supersystems as well, whose global interaction, the interaction of all the levels of the sub, um, uh, you know, the, the main, uh, let's say, strata of, um, of interactions and the supersystem of interactions. This, this global interaction is known technically and has been known essentially since the 1930s as organization. Creates secondary effects of damping and self-regulation. 
thus the swirling drifts of white cloud that thicken our atmosphere, along with nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, and traces of other crucial, unstable gases to maintain a surface temperature at once cooler than the sun, but warmer than the cosmic night, are produced by the very oceans and plant life whose subsistence in turn is guaranteed only through the protection that this filtering, insulating layer affords. A system is soft when it is flexible, adaptable, and evolving, when it is complex and maintained by a dense network of active information or feedback loops, or, put in a more general way, when a system is able to sustain a certain quotient of sensitive, quasi-random flow. As I have already implied, these ideas were not born with these images, only driven home by them. They arose in great part by the need to understand something called non-linearity, first in the complex organic systems studied by biology, and second in the military, by the need to model the nonlinear dynamics of what is, or what used to be called, moving boundary problems in ballistics and in the communication engineering design in battlefield and general intelligence operations. Now, I'm going to explain nonlinearity, though I do want to insist on the, um, on the uh, very important uh, military links. Um, uh, with these types of sciences, which really did rise out of special uh, study groups organized by various aspects of the military. For, for example, this whole problem of planetary dynam dynamics was in fact originally, this research was paid for uh, by NASA and by Jet Propulsion Laboratories back in the 70s, just before when they were planning their, uh, their Mars program. Uh, they wanted a, uh, they wanted, let's say, a, a means of uh, ascertaining uh, whether or not life existed on any other planet, specifically Mars, and they wanted to figure out a way that, you know, in a way, an abstract way, um, in which this could be um, uh, uh, ascertained. Uh, it was a little problematic because the thermodynamic model, which was essentially that of James Lovelock, uh, told them well in advance and without, um, you know, with complete reason that he could tell already you didn't have to send um, he didn't have to send a ship out to Mars, and they were a little bit um, uh, vexed by that, obviously. But um, it's important to understand as well, I mean, the, the series of, um, uh, uh, the amount of, uh, let's say, money, interest, and research that has gone into the study of nonlinear systems of this kind, uh, going way back to the 70s, and that sounds like way back, but these days things are so fast-breaking in this field that um, that really is sort of almost prehistoric. Um, in any case, I won't go on. There are all, all kinds of other fairly interesting programs that have been um, uh, described a little bit in the press lately. Um, I will explain. I, I do feel that the problem of linear and nonlinear systems, the distinction between the linear and the nonlinear, is actually fundamental. And it does constitute what may be the single most important conceptual development of our modernity. The modernity I'm talking about is the modernity of the 20th century. Now, this, the distinction between linear, and it goes back essentially to Poincaré and the three-body problem, which is uh, approximately the 1890s. The distinction may be summed up as follows, and this is a very simple distinction, and it is really drawn from a field, a new field called artificial life. Uh, it's simple enough to understand. Linear systems are those for which the behavior of the whole, the behavior of the entire system, is simply the sum of the behavior of the parts. That's, an, that's a linear system. A nonlinear system, quite simply, is one in which the behavior of the whole is more than the behavior of the parts. Now, without lapsing into uh, received ideas or mysticism, um, there is a way of beginning to explain uh, more specifically what the differences are here. Linear systems obey what is called the superposition principle. Its constituent parts, the constituent parts of a linear system, are simply independent and may be understood in isolation. Non-linear systems cannot be explained simply through an understanding of their parts for the very reason that the primary behaviors, with the emphasis on behaviors, the primary behaviors and properties, or rather the primary behaviors are properties of the interactions between the parts. When the system is broken down, these interaction-based properties disappear. 
So the pertinent and interesting properties of nonlinear systems are therefore, are therefore based on, on their organization and their form, not their structure. And I do want to insist on this, though I probably won't have time to develop it. Um, the opposition between organization and structure is really the one that I want to um, insist upon, that the movement is away from structure and toward organization today, and I think this is happening virtually across the spectrum of, um, of, um, you know, of research, and I think also all different kinds of practice. And what I do want to do, or I do want to insist, is the problem of form. The problem of form actually belongs to the problem of organization, um, and one would, uh, uh, and there's a long lineage, an interesting one that goes back to people like Darcy Thompson, for example, the early 20th century, and of course that cuts through all of the dynamicists and the topologists and you know the catastrophe theorists, etc. Form then is a pro today is a problem of organization and not structure. Nonlinear systems change. And there's the time factor again. They change in indeterminate ways, and indeterminacy is a very important aspect of these systems. They change in indeterminate ways over time, continually manifesting new properties, new forms, and new structure. These systems, even when not organically based, are increasingly associated with and described by the processes of life. Now, this is a very important shift as well. It is no longer necessary um, uh, it is, let's say, it is now possible to think the problem of life almost purely in terms of a certain type of algorithm, a certain geometrical problem, independent of substrate, which is to say that life is no longer understood uniquely as uh, subsisting on an organic substrate, and that there are um, this move toward geometrical, organizational, and formal problems, uh, formal aspects of life and behavior are making this possible. Now, I will, um, move, uh, I will move now, in fact, to a biological model. One very small uh, example, which I hope will be of some interest, um, um, even centrally, to, um, to architects. Um, could I ask for the next uh, two slides on each side, please? The next set of images is drawn from a 1957 work on genetics by the great theoretical biologist Conrad Waddington. What we are looking at here are two views of a single soft system, deceptively simple looking as with all soft systems, though in fact unfathomably complex and rich. The system modeled before you is what Waddington has called an epigenetic landscape. Epigenetic, epigenesis. Epigenesis is the term used to describe the relatively mysterious process of how form emerges gradually out of a formless or homogeneous environment or substrate. Uh, epigenesis describes the emergence of form in, uh, in an embryo, um, whereas a more general term is morphogenesis, um, which is really the genesis or the arising of form. Now, in embryology, and I would argue, um, almost as much in modern philosophy. It remains a theoretical question, a theoretical question of how specific features can emerge from nothing, how a differentiated embryo can emerge from the blastula, a field of perfectly identical cells. I will deal with a single aspect of Waddington's diagrams only to show how the nonlinear and soft systems approach was able to get at the intractable problem of epigenesis or morphogenesis, and how historically it was able to displace, in large part, the classical atomist or mechanistic theory of development. It was for long believed, and I suppose many of you would recognize this from high school textbooks, uh, that individual genes controlled individual traits, such as eye or hair color, and that an organism is little more than an assembled mosaic constituted by the sum of these information units and the traits that express them. What I'm essentially arguing against is the mosaic theory of space um, in favor of this dynamic, um, let's say, organizational uh, theory. It was also believed that the genetic material 
in a given cell somehow and alone contained all the necessary information for the assembly of an organism, telling it precisely what to do and when to do it, then when to stop and do something else, yet without ever proposing a theory of how a cell was supposed to know who it was in the first place with respect to its identical neighbors. Where did the message of difference come from? How was it managed and where was it stored? The first blow to the classical mechanistic theory came when it was discovered through experimentation that a two-celled embryo, when split apart, and I don't mean naturally split apart, I mean when it was actually torn apart in, la in, you know, in the laboratory, in vitro, when a two-celled embryo was split apart, it developed into two full and perfect organisms, not two previously specified halves. It was later found that a single gene actually affected not one, but indeed a wide range of physical characteristics in the developing animal. Then, that a large number of genes often contributed together to determine a single characteristic, a single phenotypic characteristic. Now, I want to insist on the use of that word, phenotype and genotype. The phenotype is essentially the Thank you. The behavioral, um, let's say, the behavioral morphology, the actual shape, form, characteristic, trait um, that actually emerges, whereas the genotype, let's say, is the two-dimensional uh, code, uh, which somehow, by some mysterious process, actually generates all of this complex um, and multi-dimensional uh, behavioral morphology. Now, the reason I bring it up is partly because the concept, the relationship of genotype, again, the two-dimensional code, to the phenotype, this complex, um, extremely rich um, morphological structure, um, has, is becoming increasingly generalized in social theory. And um, I also believe that somehow it is that space between the genotype which is, I mean, fundamentally, it's a, essentially it's a chemical, physical, physical chemical model, and this other thing which we call, you know, the, the beautiful plenitude of life. Uh, it's essentially that space in between, those, that transformational space, uh, which is, I believe, uh, one that needs and ought to be thought through in architecture. And finally, we're just moving through the history of um, kind of a very truncated history of embryology. And finally, that a forced mutation, and this is in some ways one of the most marvelous, a forced mutation such as the surgical elimination of the gene for eyes in the Drosophila fly produced eyeless flies only for a couple of generations before the eyes were mysteriously restored. And I note not the genetic information, the eyes only restored by hidden repair mechanisms buried inside the system. What became clear, at least to some theoretically minded biologists, was that genes are no more than rudimentary anchors or triggers in a manifoldly more complex dynamical system of active, nonlinear relationships. In other words, genes work together. They work together in large integrated complexes to produce effects rather far removed from and infinitely more subtle than the raw information stored in their own molecular data banks. Now the ball in the diagram on your left represents a cell or a cluster of cells in an early developing embryo. The embryo's, what we will call its directedness or general tendency, let's say, to develop in this particular environment that's modeled here, rather, for example, than die or abort, is topologically represented by the downward slope of the epigenetic plane. The flow from above to below follows a time axis. The basins or channels etched into the landscape, the rivulets, represent pathways of potential flow or development. The ball, as we know, will end up somewhere at the bottom of the landscape and within our frame. In other words, its general pathway is determined, but its specific pathway can only be determined through real-time events, depending on conditions, environmental and otherwise, selection pressures, 
which is a very complex thing, in fact, far more complex than anyone ever knew until it was uh, so profoundly problematized in the last uh, couple of decades, and perturbations encountered along the way. Remember, even variations of temperature sometimes are, uh, are uh, even very subtle ones, can be absolutely decisive in embryonic development. In fact, I just read, I think on the airplane out here, um, a new theory published in the Economist magazine, some new ideas that are circulating about what morning sickness is. And essentially, one of the theories is that it's basically a way of having of the mother um, uh, avoiding anything that can be even minutely, more infinitesimally toxic to the um, to the developing embryo in the first three months. When, of course, all of these fabulous epigenetic events are transpiring at breakneck speed. What this model shows, the model we're looking at is how mobile developmental systems are nearly always smooth. In other words, continuous and integral. I think this is quite important because it really suggests, if you like, a whole, oh, I don't know what, I mean, a whole family, let's say, of morphological uh, flavors, if you like, which I believe if one really began to look at it, I mean, it's something I will, it's something I do do, but I don't like to show slides of it because then people just assume, ah, you know, that's what it is that we're supposed to do. But I think that these tendencies are, are beginning to manifest themselves all over, um, all over the place today. Um, so that these systems are smooth, in other words, continuous and integral. They are sensitive to perturbation, but only up to a point. They are directed systems, continually integrating a multiplicity of regimes. Now, what you see on your right is the same epigenetic landscape, though seen now from below revealing the intricate system of chemical interactions that determine at a distance its topographical features. The pegs, those pegs that you see in the, embedded in the, um, in the flat plane below, the pegs organized rationally on that lower plane represent genes. Now it's important that they are represented um, in a purely, um, let's say, Cartesian, rational, Euclidean, etc. fashion. Uh, they simply are not important, if you like, to, um, uh, to problematize them at this point. There is enough complexity introducible in the system in the space in between. Anyways, they represent genes, but the space immediately above them, that's to say in that kind of synapse um, of, uh, of, of interconnected lines, the space immediately above them represents an entirely non-linear space of correlations and continuous interaction. Each guy rope, each one of those ropes connecting it with the surface above, represents a chemical tendency. That's to say, really importantly, it's a tendency or a pressure, not at all a static or precise form that needs to be translated. A tendency produced by a gene, and you'll also notice that the genes produce, uh, they tend to produce more than one tendency. But only very rarely do these influences make direct contact with the epigenetic surface. Their influences are always mediated by their interaction with many other chemicals and genes. And every point in the system is at least somewhat sensitive to any change anywhere else in the network. At the same time, at the same time that the system sustains an acute sensitivity to the fine-grained disturbance and information in its environment, it carries inbuilt protection against too radical a sensitivity to perturbations and mutations through its flexibility and its capacity to absorb and diffuse the effects of a few localized catastrophes, such as, you know, cut or broken guy ropes. Now, this is very important. It's very important to understand that the conditions of life are essentially suspended, if you like, between a certain necessary quotient of sensitivity to, to the outside, but also a certain ability to resist, uh, a certain robustness, if you like, to resist uh, excessive um, um, and catastrophic perturbation. So its sensitivity parameter is limited, and that's something that only today is beginning to be understood as being really one of the constituent aspects of the generation of complexity and of spontaneous behavior. No action in any single gene can fail to affect or be regulated by all the other genes in its functional complex. Even in the case where entire regions get blown out, the landscape will undergo deformation, but this will not prevent the system's inbuilt or flexible strategies 
from finding a smooth and harmonious, even if a little monstrous, pathway through it. Soft systems evolve by internal regulating mechanisms, yet always in collaboration with forces and effects arriving from an outside. It is still not understood precisely from where these strange properties of soft systems actually arise. Directedness, sensitivity, and active organization are equally processes that have been associated at least since the 1930s with the phenomenon of life. Again, the phenomenon of life is no longer simply the study of life in organic milieus. What has changed is that geometry, geometry has recently become the dominant form of modeling and experimentation regarding problems of self-organization and the autonomous processes of living systems. Again, the lineage here is essentially people like Darcy Thompson, uh, the biologist who was once, uh, the theoretical biologist who was once um, um, absolutely standard reading in architecture schools, and up through people, of course, like Waddington and Rene Tum, um, the um, topologist. Now, very recently, a potential breakthrough was made by Stuart Kaufman and others at the Santa Fe Institute. The Santa Fe Institute is this place where, essentially, I, I would say it's where the Santa Cruz um, chaologists uh, essentially moved, um, uh, I suppose, sometime in the 1980s. In any case, they're sponsoring some extraordinary research there now. And this fellow, Stuart Kaufman, has recently published, I think only as recently as four or five months ago, uh, this extremely important paper. Um, the breakthrough concerns uh, a kind of newly discovered specific critical point in geometrical organization. Could I have the next uh, slide, please? Just uh, flick both of them. Great, thank you. Now, in uh, Kaufman's experiment, standard Boolean networks were set up like the two you are looking at here in the diagram on the screen. Just want to make sure that they're, uh, they're upright. Yeah. Now, a Boolean network Try to follow this. It's really, really, very simple. Don't get, you know, don't get math anxiety here, um, because um, you know, it won't be any fun if you don't if you don't follow it. It's really very, very easy. Um, it's essentially a Boolean network is a network of linked elements between which, very simply, information is passed in a very rudimentary way. Each element, for example, the elements I'm talking about here are the disks, the black and white disks. Each element may be in an on or off state here, black or white, and every element to which it is linked will therefore know what state the first element is in. Each unit switches itself on or off based on what it learns about the states of those elements connected directly to it. The rules for how an element is supposed to act in relation to what inputs, they're, they're arbitrary and they're absolutely of no interest to you, so I mean, you just forget about it, don't worry about it, simply that there are excuse me, that there are certain rules and that these rules are established at the outset. All one does is wire up the elements, establish the rules, turn the system on, and watch it go. Now, in brief, and I'll, I'm going to, I'm afraid to truncate and simplify the, uh, the findings of this experiment, but what the Santa Fe experiment showed was that for a wide range of dial, for a wide range of dial settings, or a wide range of instructions, let's say, the system's initially random behavior, let's say the system begins sort of randomly and it percolates all over the place, the system's initially random behavior would soon become highly ordered, that is, locked, locked into a state where most of the elements stopped undergoing any further change at all. Now, that's what you see here basically in the left diagram. The elements in the blue regions are essentially locked or frozen and are no longer capable of any activity. While the red regions, the, little, the, the, the elements in the little islands of red, they represent, again, islands of activity that will continue fluctuating forever. Now the idea is, is once a system has settled into a state like this, you can go in there and you can muck about as much as you want with the elements. The point is, is that they will basically always return all of the elements in the blue area, they'll return to this state, uh, to the state that they're actually in, as you see them here, whereas uh, you can create some kind of little islands of life in the red areas, but they're absolutely incapable of communicating themselves, if you like, through the system. So what you essentially have here, 
um, in those classic terms, is a failure to communicate. Nothing that happens inside of any one of the red areas will ever be able to uh, achieve any kind of um, um, uh, collective, let's say, behavior or um, structure with any of the other areas. Now, what they found, and what was interesting, is that above a certain critical point on the dial, the system will actually manifest behavior of a very different kind. It now will remain in wild, chaotic flux, developing only very few isolated, frozen regions. That's what you see there on the right, on the right side. So there you see, in fact, what you have now is a couple of islands of frozen activity, essentially in a sea of wild, well, not even wildly, but nonetheless loosely percolating um, um, uh, flux. In the first case, the first case, which is on your left, random mutations or perturbations introduced into the system will be... system, which is called avalanches, and the, you know, the, it's known as damage in Boolean network theory, it will affect and alter the activity of nearly every unfrozen element in the system. Now, what we have here is not quite what we had in Waddington's diagrams. So what we have here is a totally dead and frozen uh, state, absolutely incapable of communicating its differences, if you like, through itself. On the other side, we have something that's much too wild to ever actually take on life in any kind of environment. But they came up with another idea. The next step was to relate the behavior patterns of these two networks to the classical states of matter. And let's just say there are three classical states of matter, even though I know these are being problematized. Essentially, um, uh, solid, liquid, and, and, and vapor or gas. According to the model developed by Christopher Langton, one of the gurus of artificial life, they characterized the first highly ordered system, the one on your left, as a solid. A system where molecules, for example, tend to line up in fixed patterns. And the second system, the maximally disordered system that you see on your right, as a gas. That's to say where molecules move around absolutely randomly. Networks in an unstable intermediate state were then hypothetically referred to as liquid. Here they're actually treating liquid as a kind of a transition state or as an intermediate state of matter. And the intermediate states uh, are essentially what the study of life is all about and what, in fact, all the problem, all the uh, pr uh, uh, phenomena of self-organization have uh, recently become uh, obsessed with. The idea then was to carefully lower one parameter to draw the system very close to, but not across, the critical value of the phase transition from solid to gas, in order only slightly to melt actually to melt some, but only some, of the frozen elements. It was at this very precarious point of liquefaction, this point at the very edge of chaos, that suddenly a new range of interesting behaviors emerged. What is important is that what emerged was not a single type, but rather, or but indeed a variety and a balance of behaviors. So what we have now is already this process of scaling. A balance of behaviors, both small and large avalanches, took place in response to changes or pressures introduced from without, demonstrating a remarkably broad spectrum of reactivity to environmental perturbation. What's very important is that, an or let's say we're talking here about organisms, it's very important that it be able uh, to resist massive damage, let's say, massive transformation to its genotype or to its phenotype, and yet at the same time, in order to be truly an adaptable organism, it has to be capable of actually undergoing at the right moment when it's absolutely necessary a rather total or fundamental transformation and still surviving. So what you absolutely have to have is extremely sensitive parameters enabling a minimum of massive um, damage but still allowing for the possibility of that type of change. Communicability and sensitivity, but also robustness and processes of dynamic self-regulation were manifested. That's to say they actually came up with this, this, this network that began almost to, to percolate in front of their eyes as if it were a living animal. Identical, in fact, manifesting the behavior identical, in fact, to that demonstrated in the evolutionary and developmental processes modeled in Waddington's diagrams. The Boolean network experiment shows, 
and it's, cr it's crucial, in fact, because it shows that the complexity of a system, the complexity of a system peaks at its liquid transition point. In other words, at its softest state. There would indeed seem to be much to celebrate in the advent of this new, flexible, complex, soft approach to the processes of nature and form, the supplanting of an old and partly moribund mathematical rationality and ethos whose rigidity has finally brought it to the point of diminishing returns. And I'm referring there, of course, to the classical scientific um, mechanistic uh, or atomist tradition. But we must not jump too uncritically onto the suppleness bandwagon. For if these new models, these new intellectual models, are arising today with such extraordinary force and rapidity in our philosophical and scientific milieus, it is at least partly because the details of our material existence are undergoing on many strata a similar epochal transformation from a solid to a liquid state. What I would like to do now uh, um, in the last section this is the, uh, of the paper is begin to detail, uh, but rather schematically, the problem, the, I mean, the way this phase transition is beginning to affect our technological and material milieus and why, in fact, we're at a very crucial moment historically. The types of material transformation I'm talking about belong to two only apparently distinct categories or domains of technological organization. The first has to do with the large-scale or macroscopic integration of machines of all different types, scales of all different types, scales, and distances apart. The second, the second type of transformation deals with the microscopic penetration into and exploitation of the fine structure of matter. Well, w one of the fundamental uh, innovations that is taking place today is, this: is of course, the discovery of the richness of intermediate states, the capacity, the newly discovered capacity that matter can actually compute, and that, in fact, it's this computing process, with this thing that I recalled at the beginning of the paper, a dynamics of information, was, in fact, not only the source of life and self-organization and difference in the universe, but that, in fact, it was something, it is finally something and I don't mean this necessarily in any kind of great cheerleader way, but it is finally something that can be tapped, and it is being tapped. In the first category, I'm referring to the complex, electronic, and for the most part, digital infrastructural systems that on a global scale will link together a wide variety of machines and machinic clusters in the same way that telephones are connected today. I want to insist on the telephone as a certain type of uh, paradigm, if you like, of, of technological innovation and, let's say, even social geometrical organization, because it is fully organismic, if you like, in its, in its functioning, entirely different from the way it was, um, from the, um, uh, the original configurations uh, through which it was introduced into our culture, which was essentially um, a broadcast um, uh, technology to broadcast uh, concerts in Central Europe to people's houses. Now this will certainly, almost certainly, entail the digitalization, I mean, the telephone does remain today without question uh, the paradigmatic uh, technology for the transformations I'm talking about. Uh, this will almost certainly entail the digitalization of existing analog technologies such as television and telephone, permitting the in-depth, and I really insist on this in-depth, I'll try to explain what that in-depth means, the in-depth integration of sound, text, image, and raw data technologies, as well as their large-scale transmissional infrastructure, and this both from the software and hardware points of view. Um, the hardware uh, problem here is essentially one of this, you know, whether, for example, America wants to spend the $300 billion to entirely rewire the country with fiber optic cable, which is essentially what, it will, what one will need in order to actually implement this, 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 this total integration of wide bandwidth or of, in fact, you know, uh, 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 various bandwidth technologies within a single environment. The idea here simply is that there will no longer be a telephone cable distinct from uh, a telephone wire distinct from a television cable cable, for example, but that all of these, there will be a single cable carrying all information um, of every kind and all communications uh, into the household, which will be, of course, met by a multimedia station or something worse, like a VR station. But secondly, 
and of equally great importance will be the relentless VR virtual reality uh, of equally great importance will be the relent the relentless phenomenological integration of the human nervous system for these machines and machinic clusters or complexes will penetrate and occupy not simply our material sort of concrete worlds but in fact our attention worlds our attention worlds as much as possible qualitatively that is as integrated environments rather than as distinct objects per se this is partly because materially they present themselves literally as fluid multi-dimensional polyphonic sensoriums just think of the levels for example of information imparted while watching a 40s thriller on television or during an even random telephone conversation with a friend or relative but also partly because we will interact with these machines these complexes these software sensoriums of course I mean multimedia and and uh, virtual reality through seamless natural interfaces that is we will we will interact directly through voice gesture touch and ultimately in entirely unconscious ways um, uh, the first point of course is that everybody knows or everyone ought to know that what is disappearing today and it's a rather momentous disappearance is the keyboard for example uh, the interface between the machine and the and the still let's say uh, uh, human organism outside of the machine uh, the other thing I want to point out is that the reason I chose those examples of the 40s thriller on television and the telephone conversation say with one's mother is simply because um, to illustrate the differences between um, what many technocrats and you know technologists uh, consider to be you know a theory of information and the differences between um, what they call wide and narrow bandwidth um, um, uh, transmissions the point being that uh, clearly uh, watching a 40s thriller, uh, only one level, for example, of the imparted information actually concerns the uh, the intuition and the reception of the actual plot, what actually happens, the actual uh, 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 details that uh, push the narrative ahead. Clearly, one also watches oneself watching a 40s thriller. One, one notices, for example, the clothing, the, 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 the differences in posture, the jargon. Uh, you know the the furniture the the music for example I mean there is all of that kind of rich but not sufficiently let's say theorized or, or concretized um, aspects of a wide bandwidth system which is something that we're finally of course being uh, robbed of in many ways with these new information technologies and of course talking to one's mother it matters not what one says but the hideous and uh, annoying silences uh, which can last you know a nanosecond too long um, but which of course create the uh, you know that flow of information uh, now finally this soft environmental penetration of our attention worlds by technology will be affected still more deeply through the progressive saturation of even our concrete milieus by the microchip so much of our material environment that was once inert or simply mechanical will become computerized, digitized, servo-controlled, real-time responsive, and above all, interlinked. But here, in discussing software and microchip-driven milieus, one is already closing in on the second category of technical innovation and material organization namely on the microscopic domain on those processes that are elaborated at the level of the fine structure of matter and here we're talking about the whole problem of states uh, but also I mean it really I mean states what we have discovered or what is being discovered today in the West because it's certainly something that has not been lost on many other cultures is that essentially uh, behavior and properties are what determine let's say the essence of things and that these are properties of their capacities of transformation or in a, wor in a more scientific form the flow of matter is where these types of characteristics or what are known as emergent properties that's essentially where they arise dynamical environment this applies at the literal mechanical level with the emergence of programmable materials such as shape memory alloys and smart metals um, uh, you know the, uh, I suppose the most dramatic ver uh, example of the great smart metal um, 
revolution, though of course it hasn't fully happened yet, but nonetheless was uh, Terminator 2, where we saw the, um, the mechanical beast of Terminator 1 return as a kind of fluid, self-organizing um, liquid, or a liquid object. Um, I also want to insist on something that's very important. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it properly here right now, but there is no fundamental difference between the emergence of something like a real smart metal in the real world, that's to say something that actually does have those properties, and the software that would design it, or the software that would simulate, or rather, I don't mean simulate at all, I mean model it. Um, now, it should be understood that the, um, the alias software that was used to make that movie was in fact faked it, okay? They were not continuous algorithms. It was not a real computation formal transformation, topological, you know, mapping uh, uh, computation. The fact is, is that they will emerge together, that the algorithms have, are absolutely independent of substrate, whether it happens in a computer or whether they actually master it, if you like, in the metallurgical laboratories, is, uh, is there's absolutely no difference. It's really a problem of organization. And for that reason alone, it's clear that these, but not to mention the fact that they are already beginning to emerge. There are, let's say, we wouldn't call them smart metals, but what we have today are sort of charming metals. Now the emergence, for example, of glasses, ceramics, and polymers that change structure, these are also sort of these charming materials, uh, they change their structure, that is to say their shape, their color, their opacity, with variation in electric current, pressure, or temperature, classic piezoelectrics, for example. New techniques such as the integration of organic molecules and, of course, piezoelectric crystals or piezoelectric elements into the deep structure of matter, rendering it sensitive and increasingly responsive and cross-referenced with random fluctuations in its immediate environment. Though the study of molecular structure and morphology goes back at least 60 years, and I believe it was Linus Pauling, really, who initiated this um, you know, this, uh, this type of study. What is decisive today is the technical capacity for intervening actively within these structures to manipulate and even to engineer them. Work in the burgeoning fields, for example, of superconductivity, again, a problem, a morphological problem of ceramic layers and strata, especially the distribution of irregularities throughout a system and the optimal, the optimization of those irregularities to create effects which nobody can explain but they know are somehow a property of the structure of the matter. Liquid crystals, again liquid crystals, one of the classic and very important intermediate states of matter which are being exploited today. Um, and the very important thing of course is that the form and the state are now becoming coupled to one another. Uh, aerogels, which in fact are not active materials, but they're, they're fun because, because they're so beautiful in translation. They're sometimes called uh, solid smoke, sometimes gossamer solids, but they have rather extraordinary properties, which in fact, uh, the most recent one is that they are the most insulating uh, material at this point, I think, known. The recent infatuation with buckyballs, we all read about Buckminster Fullerene, that um, um, uh, synthetic carbon supermolecule. The important point is, is that it's an entirely synthesized molecule. It's, you know, it's, it's regular, it's ugly in a certain kind of way, but it has uh, spectacular properties in different configurations, including frictionlessness and uh, other things. There's the notorious Utah cold fusion experiments, which I really want, I really insist on bringing these up, if only because it was so shabbily treated by the press, and today um, the um, Cold fusion experiments are not only being reported again by the most uh, uh, prestigious scientific journals, but there are laboratories all over the world which are reporting uh, results similar to Ponce and Fleischmann. Um, though we know it's not cold fusion, it's clear that uh, uh, something new, another state, another intermediate state with a whole series of properties uh, is beginning to emerge. I don't even know how many properties there are of water, but clearly um, I think we're up to seven, eight, nine states. Eric Drexler's widely hyped speculations on experimental engineering and in infinitesimal or what are sometimes or what he calls nanotechnologies, these tiny molecular robots that one just sort of eats or has injected inside of one, um, but which do these things precisely, they tap this computing capacity. Uh, this active capacity of, 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 of molecules and microstructures. These are but a few examples that unquestionably signal the emergence of a new frontier of matter. Very soon, newer and far more astonishing developments will certainly emerge. Um, I'm going to skip this section. It really has to do with the scanning tunneling microscope. Um, 
you scan tunneling electron microscope, which can actually just get in there and pick up every little nook and cranny of any, of any um, molecular surface. What is fun about it, I'll just mention this, is some of you may have seen the IBM logo, which, has, which is the first um, atomistic, I mean, the, the, first, um, the first logo, if you like, to actually been imprinted on a molecule. They actually dropped atoms in one by one and patterned the IBM logo into a, into a molecule, and then, of course, photographed it. And then, of course, transmitted the photograph to every uh, press agency in the world. Um, uh, okay, now these, I'm going to skip this a little bit here. These purely engineering developments capable of exploiting, important now, the behavioral properties and organizational capacities, the so-called singularities of matter, that is, their fluid dynamics, okay? all of the properties that emerge around their various liquid and liquefying states and pre-liquid states, which until now lay unreachably embedded within its finest or within its deepest fine structure, will be coupled at the phenomenological scale to an intensified deployment, as well, one hopes, as an appreciation and cultivation of the enormous intellectual and sensual presence of materials and their specific properties. This is obviously something that one knows about when st one studies any of the Japanese um, uh, craft uh, disciplines. Um, uh, the important point here really is that the role of current technologies is increasingly to try to cycle up, if you like, these, these, these molecular level, these uh, 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 singularities, let's say, or properties. Um, uh, that emerge from liquid, well, these emergent features that emerge from the liquid states, and to cycle them up to the phenomenological level where they're actually experienced. Now, uh, it's not simply that we're going to be living in this lovely kind of fluid world. The problem is much more complex because they have discovered, in some ways, um, uh, uh, one, the specific capacity of life, which is essentially that it is... Um, that there are these overtone structures, I will talk about it in a minute, which are produced on uh, the, the, the interaction of simple, um, simple, uh, uh, no, very simple elementary systems um, in interaction produce extremely complex and, un, well, because nonlinear, uh, indeterminate behavior at a larger scale. Now, we shall clearly no longer be dealing purely with spatial qualities at least not simply spatial qualities the way we once were. For of increasing importance now will be the fluid capacities of interconnected and interacting material systems. Their new capacity spontaneously to move and to change, to correlate themselves to other external movements and changes, to embrace some bandwidth of the aleatory and in response to it, to undergo transformation in time. With this double movement in technological development toward both global and molecular systems of integration, a type of world emerges whose material, technical, and architectural articulations no longer simply objects, structures, or buildings, but indeed electromaterial environments at all scales, manifest themselves in a soft, perhaps insidiously holographic manner, a world where everything flows seamlessly together in real time. The complex interpenetration and integration of technical, architectural, biological, and social structures into a single, multi-level fluid suggests that only a properly cybernetic or ecological model will be adequate either for its analysis or for effective intervention within it. Our technical culture and material world are now following older but fundamental economic processes toward a potentially catastrophic phase shift to liquid or near-liquid geometries that are already beginning to take on a life of their own. One need only cite, for example, the 1987 stock market crash and the feedback loops um, um, between uh, various computers and software systems that actually accelerated and uh, galloped away, if you like, with the, um, uh, with the market that day. And the necessity, of course, for building controls uh, on the systems, which, of course, at another level, one will easily argue, all that really does is cripple or fetter them. Um, you know, uh, with respects to their more, their, their designed, let's say, productive um, um, 
um, capacities. What this means at this level of collective and social technologies is that these soft systems are actually capable of manifesting as emergent properties, effects of autonomous subjectivity. A type of subjectivity, in fact, that is distinct from and over and above those limited cognitive ones that they were locally programmed to achieve. Indeed, one of the defining characteristics of our culture may be said to be its general tendency, and they may not say this for uh, many decades, and they may look back on what happened and say this is what they did, um, its general tendency to transfer subjectivity to external networks. Now, I believe whether we want to or not, this is simply, uh, this is a process of, organ this is a, this is a, uh, this is, I mean, I don't even know if one can use the word natural, but this is a, a, an inexorable, uh, uh, aspect of self-organizing self processes, that once we have assembled this type of network that we're doing now, there will without question be, um, let's say, ghosts um, beginning to develop at higher level um, strata within the system. This forced mutation within a complex system, I'm talking about, you know, our civilization, within a complex system till now regulated by many millenniums of natural evolution will have effects that no theorist could yet possibly begin to imagine. And there is absolutely no reason to assume, based on current theoretical understanding, that the so-called life forms that will emerge from this apparatus will see us as anything more than unwelcome perturbations to be damped right out of the system in a single generation. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, someone's had, um, I don't know, does anyone have any questions? I've just discovered my pointer so I can... Um I, I'll confess to you, I don't really like answering questions. Um, and I'll answer, well, I, okay. <laughs> and? Okay, um, you know, let me first ask you, when you ask if there's anything, you mean in naturally occurring, purely linear? Well, well uh, first let, let me begin this way, by saying that books written in 1987 said that now that we've discovered nonlinearity, it seems that nonlinearity makes up the majority of uh, natural natural systems. By the time 1989 started rolling around, they started saying nearly all systems are uh, non-linear and that linear systems are actually extreme exceptions. Uh, in works written in 1990, this is amazing, they are now basically saying that linear systems are unimaginably rare. Unimaginably rare. That they were in fact made so through the models of um, you know, essential mechanistic modeling. I mean, the need, for example, to understand acceleration meant, of course, uh, doing something with the friction problem. Um, now, you ask, at the same time, whether one can begin to talk about a purely nonlinear world uh, and whether it's even interesting to do so. I think that mentally, it's unhygienic. No. 
Yes, in classic scientific, um, like in differential equations. Uh, differential equations are, sen solvable differential equations are purely linear. Um, whether solvable linear equations have a real correlate in the world is something nobody really knows. But your question is more interesting because it could be seen philosophically. Uh, in which case, I think that it's very important to understand that a system, a really complex system, is made up, of course, of such, such a diverse number of periodicities and, and qualities, if you like, of systems coursing through it, that it is no longer really so important nor possible to fully characterize individually the, the systems, but really uh, an attempt, and this can only be done really through intuition or increasingly subtle but inexact, to use a word that I think comes from Husserl, but uh, non-exact methods of, of sort of going with the flow. The idea is to watch behavior patterns um, and to begin, like, you know, there are some people who it seems, for example, who can intuit the movements of the stock markets, people who've been around it for 30 or 40 years. There are some people who seem to have a far better than random uh, luck at predicting movements of stock markets. What, one, what can one say? It's not testable. It's one of the great aspects of nonlinearity, not testable. Uh, you mean linear systems in life? I mean, no, only in the ways it was modeled. I, by the way, I am not an expert. I, I read the textbooks, but there's, it's slow going, and I got about 2,000 more pages to go. <laughs> yes, I see a hand there. Yeah. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, that is, of course, what is being hailed now as the great revolution in computers, um, uh, is the ability to begin modeling these types of uh, things. If you're asking me, if you actually build the hardware, are you talking about actually building massive distributed parallel networks that will actually self-organize? Absolutely, it's happening, it's happening every month. Uh, one thing I will say is that the AI, the artificial intelligence pathway to the goal is, in my humble opinion, completely off and it's the artificial life pathway uh, which will which will get there first um, uh, AI is really still using the mimetic model of trying to uh, build a machine that thinks like the brain whereas a life is really interested in understanding the processes by you know that uh, and and they will they will just model it they'll set it up in some either in a computer, which everybody realizes now the computer is this thing that can, that essentially can uh, be programmed to imitate matter. And it's essentially that problem that has, I think, characterized um, a revolution to come in the 90s, you know, which is just really beginning, started, you know, to happen. I mean, it came out of chaos science, but, um, you know, they really, it took them years to understand what the heck it was that their computers were doing. And now they've understood what the computer can really do well. It can't think on its own, but it can function as a first order system. You know, it, it can begin to, well, it can begin to self-organize, but it has to be introduced at the level of, of an elemental uh, unit, let's say, like in a Boolean network. Yes, Aaron, <laughs> after that beautiful introduction. <laughs>
Listen, let me say this. Uh, I think you ask the million dollar question, but I think you've made the mistake. You should not ask it now. You should not ask me. Um, there are a lot of reasons why I say that. To begin with, there are many ways of beginning. But this is truly, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pioneer. Well, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it could come down to saying basically a building has to stand up and enough of your liquid geometries because, you know, that'll just bring the building down on our heads. Uh, pardon? Well, I, l let me just say this. I think the question may be badly posed as well. It may be a million dollar question, but million dollar questions usually remain unanswered. Why? Because the questions, they lose their, their, they lose their own uh, milieu, for example, where they make sense. History goes on, and people don't ask that type of question anymore. Um, I think that's certain to happen, and it's already happening. The question is, what type of questions should we be asking? And I feel that one, I mean, my own, in my own work, you know, in the studios that I teach, um, one of the things I do try to do is I try to shift, uh, I think one thing is certain is that if, if the intermediate state is where it all happens, uh, it's probably interesting to try to understand where the emergent properties or the interesting behaviors, for example, in our material environments are taking place. And are they, in fact, natives of the classical levels where we have taught or learned, um, learned composition? Is the building, you know, is the city as, as such, the, um, the domain in which the, Im the really interesting uh, processes are taking place, or are they beginning to happen at some other level? Um, history has taught us that that's essentially the way historical processes change. They change in nature. They go through phase shifts um, where um, there are fundamental transformations. So I would have to say that the question is not necessarily, even though I happen to be a great believer, I'm a formalist, as you can hear. I don't know if many of you can hear that, but essentially I am despite myself. Um, I am very interested in morphology, and I do believe that even like in the great cathedrals, the way in which they manifested the classical relationships of harmonic proportions in music, for example, and the way that in some fundamental way that organizes a world for a passerby, I believe that there are apprehensibly shapes and forms and relationships which we see and I frankly would have to say that we see them in uh, very often in non-western cultures and in nature uh, one finds them in writings fantastic writings like in Goethe and Coleridge um, I think uh, one has to see differently and ask new questions and uh, you know the environment will change on its own and, of course, we have to keep up to what's going on, too. I mean... Now, it's, there's no question about it. I agree with everything you just said. We could not have gotten here without soft systems. That's for sure. Uh, the argument really is that something is changing today, and that is that the soft system itself, or the dynamo, the soft dynamo, is switching levels. And I think that's very important to track it and to stay with it. 
because, you know, I also have an optimistic version of this lecture, you know, a little Buddhist kind of uh, tirade. But um, um, I think it's very important to track it and stay with it right now because it can go either way. And what is certain is that there is so little, I mean, you know, all of these people, they vote Democrat, they're nice people, the scientists, but they're cheerleaders. They're cheerleaders, they truly are. They, um, they're so interested in their material, but they don't think, you know, what is the, con what are the social consequences? What are the, you know, what are the consequences to civilization? What are the deprivals that, that you know, that we, that these things uh, bring along with them? Uh, so, I mean, it's really, it's, it's up to architects, the kind of um, commandos, the intellectual commandos, one would hope, of the material and geometrical world to, um, to engage, just to engage. Or what do they say, what do they say in Vietnam? Um, contact, yeah, right, they had to make contact with the enemy. Um, um, that's really all I can advocate today. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Yes, dif mm, intentionally. Okay. Well, I have great sympathy with why you wouldn't leave it out. But nevertheless, at the last moment, now you say that the architects are commanding the state designers of the. Oh, could be. In a way, this belongs to this belongs to another history, which, in a way, might is the real uh, history of the 20th century, <clears throat> which is the history of the abstract machine, and that is not necessarily a Deleuzian concept. It was one that was used by. Um, it's one that is still current, I would say, in um, in certain theoretical mathematical milieus. But essentially, what it means is this: is that for the first time in the 20th century. It became possible to abstract or to express in an algorithm what it is that a machine did. Uh, you know, it, you find it in Gödel, you find it in Turing, you find it, I mean, that was essentially the idea, that a machine, in fact, could be a set of numbers and a relationship between them. Um, uh, the point, really, that I'm making here is that there are, the that the distinction between the theoretical and the, or, I mean, it's no longer interesting to talk about theory and practice as separate. What is interesting is to understand the relationship between abstract and concrete. Um, it's also uh, important to understand that uh, there are different regimes where the abstract and the concrete take up different places and establish, let's say, a different relationship to one another. The fact is, is we're moving into one now where it is no, it's no longer a, uh, a significant distinction that um, the techniques of knowing and, th and, and doing and making are inseparable. Now what does this mean? It means that in a certain sense each one becomes invisible to the actor who is in some ways doing the other. Now it's a problematic world. Now what does that mean? It probably means a whole profusion of different types of practices that we know nothing about, we can only speculate upon. Um, now the thing is this, is that how often have we been self-conscious enough to watch our culture transform? It's clearly a modernist kind of, you could say fetish, but at the same time, if one were to depathologize it, I think we would probably, maybe beautifully, 
overcome our modernness and our westernness and there might be something out there for us that you know I mean I, I don't mean to continue the stupid I don't know what the hell I'm saying to you right now but I think that you know I, I don't mean to be messianic I really mean that, that, that it's clear that um, at least one can define theoretically a transformation which is huge like equivalent but reverse of let's say the introduction of the clock in the 13th century in the 14th century or double entry bookkeeping or perspectival um, uh, method I think it's possible to talk in those terms about a transformation occurring today, you know, and to tremble. I don't know what else to do at this point. <laughs> yeah. Did you say a model or? You know, I, I, I actually couldn't say, I couldn't have said it better than you. Um, both, perhaps, simultaneously. You know, at this, I, I think there's hope. Uh, I think the, I think as technology comes to mimic, and our material world comes, in fact, to mimic the once invisible but fundamental processes of nature, um, I think there's a window that opens up for us. I think obviously ecological models, green politics, I mean there's all kinds of things. Um, and all of those things will be part of the mixture of historical struggle. Um, you know, I want, I frankly, you know, this is a problem, I frankly want to be optimistic and pessimistic simultaneously, equally. All right, I can, wait, one more question. Huh? David Lindbergh. <laughs> <laughs> you're not you're not human, David. That's why. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>